Thank you very much, Richard. Your Excellency, thank you again, and welcome to the Gulf Intelligence Energy Markets Forum. Thank you for your time that you've taken to be with us today, and we look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts now on, on, on the various uh, points of discussion today. We've got uh, about 45 minutes for this keynote and feature interview, and we're going to start by touching on uh, a couple of general points uh, affecting the, the global energy industry, and then move on uh, our focus specifically to talk about Iraq, and then hopefully we'll have some time to uh, about 15 minutes or so to, to take some questions and comments from the audience, which is very much a part of today's objectives. So we look forward to that. So thank you again for your wonderful introduction. And I think I'd like to uh, touch on a point that uh, Christopher Bake brought up, which is uh, the whole sort of evolution or revolution, let's say, of shale oil and the development of that, and how you see that, if at all, affecting uh, the industry dynamics, as Chris uh, outlined in his speech. Do you see this as a dramatic change or uh, gradual? Well, um, this development has been very welcome by um, all countries uh, and, uh, and by OPEC um, uh, countries as well. Let's not forget that um, Shell were basically um, oil and gas has been uh, uh, produced um, in the past, um, has been there and it has been known, but technologies were not available that can um, extract it at reasonable cost or have um, sufficient uh, recovery potential till recently. And what we are seeing um, is very encouraging but um, still, the fact that um, these shells are there everywhere in the world, they are there in Europe, they are there in Asia, and yet other nations have not been very keen to invest and develop and produce oil or gas from these shells, by itself indicate that uh, not everybody is confident that um, that um, source if we look at just the U.S. as yes. one of the largest consumers in the world, and it has made a lot of progress on its shale production and, uh, uh, and putting that towards exports as well in terms of refineries, um, do you see that as a game changer alone? Uh, it is obviously, you know, it takes half its uh, daily imports from OPEC. How, how will it affect, for example, OPEC's uh, influence on, on the market? For the U.S., it has been um, a big change, obviously. Uh, but let us not forget for the U.S. to be able to produce oil, uh, specifically from Shell, to replace its current import of about eight to nine million barrels, would require thousands, perhaps 10,000 um, uh, drilling uh, rigs. And again, uh, let's remember that Unlike the conventional oil, once you drill uh, to produce from the shell, you can only produce for a few months, and then you have to abandon the well and go for another well. So this will be a constant drilling using thousands of rigs all the time. And um, how um, economically feasible that is going to be at that scale to replace all the imports that's needed is to be seen. I don't think any, anybody can predict at this stage, but clearly um, the U.S. is going to reduce its oil imports. Uh, the gas story, the gas shell, uh, the shell gas is, uh, is more, uh, have been more convincing, more impressive, but we have not really seen that success in the oil, although there has been a production. I personally do not believe that um, the U.S. Uh, will can replace all its import from abroad with um, shell oil in the uh, um, two or three years. Okay, if we can turn and look at sort of demand and demand projections and the, how the industry is maybe looking to tackle uh, these in the next sort of 25 year period. I mean, demand for natural gas is expected to rise by more than 60%, the global energy demand by 30% by 2040. Um, and most of this additional gas supply, at least, is going to be coming from unconventionals like shale 
uh, and others. And there's another, the main net driver of this is electricity generation, particularly in the developing world, which is looking to add one and a half billion new users in the next uh, 20, 20 years, which is a massive, massive draw. Um, the IAEA has forecasted that the cumulative investment that's needed to ramp up oil and gas supplies generally um, over the next 25 years is $19 trillion. Now, where is the capital going to come from to ramp up this production capacity over the next period? Well, if we're, going, if we're talking about shale gas, um, that's... The, the focus will be unconventional, which well, includes shale. Yeah, the unconventional uh, will obviously have to come from the currently producing countries. Most of that gas is associated, and uh, a lot of it, of course, is like from Qatar and Iran and, uh, and Russia is a free gas. Most of these countries have capitals to develop. They don't need to rely on the uh, financial institutes. And um, there is a number of major IOCs with sufficient resource, fund resources to be able to um, help them develop these um, fields. Take Iraq, for example. Um, we started um, at a level where we didn't really have any financial uh, resources, we had the natural resources, but um, the IOCs were very willing to come and invest as much um, uh, investments are required to develop these fields. I yeah. think the same story will be any, anywhere else. If you find the resources, I don't think the capital is going to be the problem. But given the nature of these more, maybe more difficult fields or unconventional resources, do you think that's going to impact, you mentioned IOCs, uh, who are going to be developing these fields, is it going to impact, for example, the MP contracts, the structure of those? Do those need to be changed in countries like Iraq to attract that type of investment? Look, the um, marginal fields, whether they are deep ocean or some other environments, are only going to be um, viable or, uh, economically if the oil price and is, is, is at a level that can justify that kind of investment. Unlike the conventional fields, I mean, I mean, Iraq is exception. We have the lowest production cost in the world. But um, even the other Gulf countries, the other OPEC producing countries, normally the production costs are, are much less than what companies need to, um, uh, to get from developing unconventional fields. So, so long as, um, uh, the currently major producer countries can support the market with their supplies. I don't see really uh, much investment is going to be spent on marginal fields for the time being. This will only be the case when we see a serious decline in the, from OPEC or major producers in OPEC before funds are um, going to be spent in that kind of quantities on, the, on marginal fields. Okay, well, you mentioned in your speech about Asian demand and Iraq's <coughs> exports to Asia and how half of Iraq's exports are now focused on that region. Um, we have recently seen figures which indicate that there's a slowdown in Asian demand with demand shifting, stronger demand shifting to the OECD countries. And this may be short-lived. I think we would all probably agree with that. But what impact does it have currently, do you think, on the international oil industry in terms of this shift in demand dynamics? Not much, uh, simply because um, regardless what happens in Europe, the economy is picking up, but Europe has reached um, a saturation level. They're, you know, their economy may grow, but they're not going to uh, use much more oil. The story is completely different in Asia. The Asian economies uh, are at a stage of development that they can only develop by increasing their energy consumption. Um, and when we talk about um, sluggishness in the um, growth of Asian market, we are talking that the growth rate is, is, is being decreased from 10% to 7%. So um, that is still a real growth compared to um, growth in the OECD countries. And um, I don't think there demand for additional oil is going to be impacted by the um, uh, uh, current economic situation. Actually, um, 
most of the incremental oil that will be needed over the coming 20 years, according to a number of um, studies, um, the world will be needing another 20 million barrels per day additional oil over the coming 20 years, despite all the excitement about shell oil and, and, and uh, other um, uh, energy sources and so on. But still, um, we are at a stage where the demand for oil is increasing on average, because it will obviously vary um, from one year to another. But on average, about a million barrel a day additional oil will be required. And that uh, will not be coming from other than the conventional major oil producers. Um, now, Well, if we can turn to that and we can maybe talk about Iraq on that front. Um, you know, the country is, is undergoing extensive development program in its energy sector, uh, following obviously years of, of, of uh, uh, destruction from every angle. Um, you've talked before and you mentioned in your speech that Iraq technically and theoretically can become a global sort of spare capacity, perhaps even producer long term. And the, the development program the energy industry has in the five, last five years made a lot of progress, with production increasing about 40%. Um, but if we just look at the more immediate targets, and we had a quick question in the audience, I think felt five to six million was a realistic target to reach by 2020. Let's talk first about this year and this year's target of three and a half million barrels a day. It doesn't look like Iraq is on track to, to hit that target. So how does that uh, affect your outlook, for example, for hitting its target in 2015 of four to five million? Is that still realistic or have you adjusted? Well, that? our plan was to hit 3.5 million barrels by the end of tw uh, 2013. Where are we now? Uh, currently, we are producing about 3.3. Um, the last few days, if you have been following um, uh, our oil market, we have added um, from Gharraf field 50,000 barrels, which will be increased to 100,000 barrels before the end of the year. Majnoon field uh, has come online, and it's going to hit um, almost 200,000 barrels before the end of the year. There are increases in other fields, so in total, uh, we should add at least 300,000, perhaps more like 400,000 barrels to the 3.3. So we'll be talking about 3.7, 3.6 to 3.7 million barrels. So we are actually on uh, in line. However, this is despite that our total oil production includes the KRG region yes. of Iraq. And according to our um, uh, 2013 budget, KRG was required to uh, hand over uh, 250,000 barrels per day. So Iraq managed to hit the, th well, will, 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 will hit the 3.5 million barrel per day before the end of the year, even without that 250. And if KRG would have given that oil as it was required in the budget, then the production would have uh, reached 3.7 to 3.8. You mentioned the KRG. I mean, on, in terms of looking forward a little bit, and, and those two policies and sort of the general dispute about the sort of governance of, uh, of the national uh, assets. Do you see that being resolved at any time soon? It is affecting, for example, IOC's actions or non-actions in the Iraqi oil sector and influencing their decisions. How do you see that resolving? Well, um, unfortunately, this has taken much longer than necessary to resolve. Um, the hydrocarbon law, has been in the parliament since 2007. And although there has been some discussions in the recent months, but still we are not uh, seeing any breakthrough in resolving the situation. So quite frankly, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I don't expect any solution, at least during this year. Okay, and if we look at, again, the, the targets that Iraq is, uh, is, is, uh, has as its goal, again, by 2020, the target has been adjusted to 9 to 10 million barrels a day, which is still very ambitious, considering the other core challenges that the economy faces. And I know that the INES program plans to tackle some of these going forward. Uh, I mean, we could name many challenges that Iraq is facing right now, from a human resource base, political instability, the 
bureaucracy, contractual terms, some would argue are not favorable, the general legal regulatory framework, and then on a more technical front, the transport or uh, storage, uh, bottlenecks, logistics. So there's a whole list there. Um, and we probably won't have time to go into all of them today, but what would you identify is the main challenge today to tackle first? Well, there are some general <coughs> uh, uh, bottlenecks um, that are affecting our energy development plan. Um, the most uh, serious, in my view, is the terrorist attacks against oil installations and energy infrastructure in general. Um, that has been on the increase in the recent months because of the Syrian situation. Um, we have a number of bureaucratic uh, bottlenecks in Iraq, um, whether customer clearances, um, uh, other issues that companies have been complaining about. And um, although we have come a long way in resolving a number of these um, issues, but still, Corruption is a serious um, uh, issue uh, which we are trying to um, also um, tackle. But uh, these are general um, uh, 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 bottlenecks for the economic development. More specifically for the oil sector, we were concerned about our ability to export that has been taken care of with the new SPMs that has come into operation. Uh, now uh, we need to increase our storage capacity because if there's any short disruption because of bad weather in the Gulf or so on, um, that we uh, can continue to produce at the levels we are producing. Uh, we need to um, work or actually implement our uh, master pipeline uh, program. Now, internally we are doing that, but uh, we need to connect our neighbors. The situation in Syria is not very encouraging. Our relationship with Turkey in the, um, this year has not been as it should, uh, it should be. And um, there are some delays to the mid, uh, uh, in implementing our uh, new pipelines to the Mediterranean. Uh, we are moving ahead as fast as we can to construct a pipeline to Aqaba, to the Red Sea. But um, on the positive side, um, uh, we are very uh, happy that the situation in the Gulf has calmed down vis-a-vis -vis, um, Iran's nuclear program. And um, what the world was uh, fearing that there could be disruption at the Hormuz Straits and so on, seems to be very unlikely. So um, we don't really have any bottlenecks to move our oil to the international market. I mean, that, that challenge of the political instability in the region is, is a constant and, and it will change. Yes. The dynamics of that will continue to, we to, hope for not for long. to get be better or worse. <laughs> yes. um, just to go back a bit into the sort of the actual contracts that were the service contracts that were awarded in the last three to four years to international oil companies, as you mentioned that some progress has been made. It's been a bit slow at times due not to their fault but to internal dynamics in Iraq. Are there any plans within the INS strategy to uh, alter the incentives or the terms and conditions of these contracts at all? Would that perhaps push things forward a little bit or not? Actually, we have done that. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, talk, that the, the, um, the contracts that were signed required these companies to increase production very fast to a, a combined total plateau of about 13 million barrels per day. But that would have exhausted our fields um, too quickly and would not have maximized the, the possible recovery from each field. So um, soon after the contracts were signed, we have actually asked each company uh, in preparing their final development plan not to worry about the, um, the um, contracted plateau, but to tell us according to best management of the reservoir what, what, be, what, would, what would be the optimum plateau um, that can be maintained over 20 years or longer and, and maximize recovery. So the companies each has come with their own figures. 
uh, our own national team, our own international consultants. And um, there seems to be a consensus. I was personally very surprised that all these uh, figures came to you know very similar conclusion that at uh, 9 million barrels uh, per day, um, Iraq can maintain production for something like 20 years. And um, this can be reached um, depending on the world market demand because there is no point to invest money to try to increase capacity even before 2020 if your projections uh, are that the world will not be needing that much extra oil from Iraq. So um, the speed with which we are going to move is going really to be um, partially determined by the world market uh, demand growth. But um, the contracts have been amended. The IOCs, they have been happier with, uh, with the changes. Uh, they've always been complaining that the Iraqi contracts have been extremely tight, perhaps the tightest in the world. And they uh, always have asked if uh, there is any room for adjustments. Um, this, they've, uh, this we have done with these amendments. And quite frankly, I think this has been a win-win situation for Iraq to be able to um, maximize the recovery, maintain a constant um, production capacity for, uh, for 20 years. Uh, which is um, uh, very long um, in, in the oil industry. Um, some, some, some fields cannot maintain their production mm -hmm. for more than you know, six to seven years. If we can talk a little about the more sort of internally the, the refining industry and rebalancing that, you, know, you have a very fuel focused uh, uh, product uh, on, mm -hmm. on the refining uh, side and there is a focus to try and get more gas oil and gasoline and the lighter products out of your refineries. It's a huge import bill at the moment for Iraq of $250 million, I think. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, what, what plans are there to change that balance on, your, on the refinery front? Well, we do have a um, uh, plan to build four new refineries. These are um, One is Nasriya. green refineries in Nasriya. Mm -hmm. is the largest at 300,000 barrels per day. But um, three more um, in Karbala, Kirkuk, and Misan. Um, these are all available for investors. In Nasriya, we have tried to, um, uh, to work out a new formula where the Nasriya field, which is a very um, large field, a giant field, to be um, developed together with the refinery, where the refinery can get all its oil um, from that uh, oil field. And uh, we are going to have our fifth bid round in December this year. Uh, we are pleased that a number of uh, major um, companies have actually um, uh, uh, asked to join um, uh, in the bidding for, uh, for this particular field. And um, we'll have to wait and see. The contract has been amended in, in a way that can um, uh, the rates of return be more attractive? Yes, yeah. we, we, we believe so. I mean, we have made some changes already. Uh, we have discussed with the IOCs, which includes um, cancellation of the R factor uh, that required them to um, uh, receive less um, remuneration fee. Uh, this has been canceled, and some adjustments have been also made to insulate um, oil field operations from many infrastructure bottlenecks where um, if there is any delays uh, for uh, reasons not under control of the oil companies, they should not really be um, uh, 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 reduce their profits uh, or, their, uh, or the fees. Also, the uh, repayment has been uh, modified for this particular project. Uh, where the oil field uh, development, they can receive immediately as soon as they develop the oil fields um, in kind, uh, in, in crude, not necessarily having to wait for the refinery to be uh, finished. They will receive the refinery um, uh, fees uh, when they finish the refinery, but at least they will not be delayed when they finish their oil field development. And there is a number of other adjustments that have been made. Um, all these have been uh, made uh, based on requests by the IOCs um, and the refinery um, um, uh, companies that we have met. 
It has not been finalized yet, and we uh, are very happy to listen to any other amendments that they consider uh, is necessary you know, uh, to um, get them more interested to participate in the coming bid round. Okay. If we can talk a little bit about the power sector in Iraq, obviously that's a huge uh, project in motion and, and, and needs a lot of investment. The power shortages, I think, currently cost Iraq about $40 billion per year. Um, and there are plans in the works to, to revamp that sector. I think one of the main challenges is that you don't have enough gas, you need to sort of encourage more gas-fueled power generation. And that again comes back to trying to source more of the gas that's being produced in Iraq. 40% of it currently is flared and wasted. And apart from the environmental impact of that, that's clearly a waste of resource. So what strategy do you have in place to reduce the flaring and use more of that gas with the ultimate intention of resolving the uh, power sector shortages? Well, uh, power, um, electric power development have been one of the um, weaknesses um, in our development plan over the last um, 10 years, which has to be remedied. Um, Iraq has decided, and um, this will be an occasion to announce it also, that um, we are going to invite um, investors in the um, power generation. Um, that decision has been taken at the highest level in the country. Investors will be invited um, to come and build their own uh, uh, power plants uh, as IPPs and independent power producers. What's the timing of that? Um, the decision has been taken. Investors have been in, uh, uh, invited. Those who we know have been interested in the past, but now I'm making it clear to everybody that um, any investor who's interested to come and produce power in Iraq and sell it to the Minister of Electricity is most welcome to come and see me. Um, I'm heading the committee who's, uh, who's going to look at these applications and make decisions on them. Uh, you very rightly pointed out that um, this needs gas. Um, currently, the quantity of gas that is required uh, is not sufficient because our gas is mostly associated. And as we increase our production to the levels that we've been discussing, we'll be having sufficient gas in the future. But in the short term, uh, we don't have enough gas. I'll come to the flaring uh, later on. But immediately, uh, we need more gas. The only available source for, of that gas to the, for the investors and for our own power plants that we have constructed, um, 20 gigawatts of power generation is under construction right now. Uh, the immediate short-term um, solution is to get gas from Iran. Uh, we have um, been discussing this with Iran. Uh, there is already a pipeline under construction that will be ready before the end of this year. There will be another pipeline to Basra area. Uh, we hope it will be finished in six months' time. And there will be even more pipelines. Um, these are short-term contracts just to give us uh, uh, breathing space. Mm -hmm till uh, we um, increase our oil and associated gas production uh, to the levels required. As for the uh, flare gas, yes, about 40% of the Iraqi um, gas is being flared, mostly in the south. Uh, we have um, signed a contract with the consortium between Shell and uh, Mitsubishi to capture that gas and process it, but even Shell being the largest gas company in the world, they need time to do that we keep and on transporting it. it is another issue. Once you've captured it, isn't that that's quite a challenge in terms of this? You mean transporting it, you know, selling it outside? Yes, or using getting, it or getting it to market eventually outside or to in, internally as well. The Iraqi the market is going to um, need all that yes. And, um, so distributing in, it internally is not a if Let's say you captured that gas tomorrow. Would you be able to start you, we distributing do, we, it? We do have a national network uh, where, uh, where gas can be uh, moved north-south and to all the power generations. It's actually the quantity of gas that's not sufficient. But even if, we, um, if, if, if this new company can capture that gas within a few years, that is still not going to be sufficient for all the power generation that Iraq itself has already built, as I mentioned, 20 gigawatts, and the uh, new and investors, the IPPs that we are, we are inviting to come and build a new power generation. 
If we can specific, uh, just uh, focus on one or two um, projects in Iraq, uh, the West Kurna field and Exxon's recent decision um, to reduce its shareholding there, if you can give us your view on that and whether you think that's um, a negative or just it's part of the dynamics of operating. No, no, actually this was a request made by Iraq to ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil yes. was very keen to, <laughs> to um, uh, sell some of their interest in the West Qurna, but because of the problems that, um, uh, uh, that was created by Shell when they signed contracts with the KRG without the approval of the federal government, uh, Iraq uh, asked them to scale down their um, uh, operation in, in West Qurna, and they were asked to do so. This approval by the Iraqi government, will this at some point, do you think, come in the long term for the, for, the, for the sake of reaching production targets throughout the whole country? Will there be uh, a consensus on that between the KRG and, uh, and, and the Iraqi government? No, obviously, I mean, that? the uh, question of oil production and gas production and the KRG has to be solved within the framework of the Iraqi constitution. And um, this is not for the oil companies to decide um, or to interpret our constitution and, and, and who has the right or entitlement to what kind, uh, to, to what part of Iraq's oil or gas. Uh, we believe that Exxon has um, committed a serious error um, in, uh, in signing contracts without the approval of the Iraqi government. And um, uh, this has to be sorted out with them. Okay, Mr. Thank you very much. I think we're going to take it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to give uh, our delegates here in the audience a chance to comment on what the, His Excellency has already said and, and perhaps put a few additional uh, and maybe more detailed questions to him. So we have some mics on the floor. I'm going to let Kate direct. Uh, who gets the first question? Thank you. If you could please introduce yourself uh, and uh, your, uh, what company you're from. Thank you. Uh, I'm Faisal Fisharaki from FG, Your Excellency. I have uh, two questions. Uh, on uh, the fifth bid round, uh, first, uh, you know, on the fourth bid round, there was a lukewarm reception, and your emphasis was much more on gas. In the fifth round, uh, given the plateaus that you mentioned, maybe oil is not a high priority. Is it still oil and gas, or is it a big emphasis on the gas side for the fifth round? Uh, that's one question. Second question is that on the pipelines uh, which are going to come from Iran, can you give us an idea of the volume? And when you say short term, does it mean six months, or six years, or ten years? Give us an idea of what you mean by the short term. The gas from Iran. The gas from Iran, yes. both the volume and the timing. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what you refer to by the fifth bed round, because there is a mini bed round in December, specifically for the Nasri oil field, which is a giant oil field, but um, still just one oil yes, field. Yes, by the way, we still have a couple of super giant oil fields that have not even been offered for development yet. So when we are talking about 9 million barrels, this is not even developing some of the other super giant fields like the Nihran uh, Umar and so on. But um, the coming bid round, which uh, is the fifth, we had already had four, is a, f a mini bid round for the Nasriya. But then uh, immediately after that, there is another bid round, uh, which is mostly exploration for gas in the Western Desert uh, from all the way uh, the uh, Syrian desert to the uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwaiti desert. And uh, we are uh, uh, reconsidering the model contracts to make it more, attra more attractive to the companies. As for the uh, import of Iranian gas, we need it immediately to power our power generation. As a matter of fact, um, despite the um, power shortage in Iraq, we do have power plants that are ready, um, that have been um, constructed this year, but we don't have sufficient gas for them. So um, we have agreed with Iran to import gas for, f for five years, but um, that can easily be extended uh, further because there is such a strong demand for Iraqi gas 
that Iraq will have no problem exporting its gas to Europe. All our neighbors um, are uh, asking for Iraqi gas. And um, we hope Iraq is um, uh, actively encouraging all sides for um, Iran and the international community to be able to resolve their um, issues over new, uh, Iran's nuclear program. As, as soon as that is solved, um, 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 the situation will be different. Uh, perhaps then Iran can make more gas available via Iraq to the international market. Thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, we have a question over here. Thank you. Um, Kate Dorian from MIS. I was actually at the Nasseria workshop in Amman recently, and the terms that you were talking about are the suggested amendments to the contract so that you still get paid for the upstream portion because what we were told was that the companies would not be paid until at least half of the, the first train of the refineries is, is, is ready. Well, the uh, final version has not been uh, uh, agreed upon yet. So these are basically ideas. Some of these ideas have been put forward by the um, IOCs. And uh, we are considering for the upstream portion to be paid even if the refinery will take longer time to be constructed. Thank you. I think we have a question at the back, Kate, over there on the right. It's good that you can see them because yeah, of these about. lights. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for allowing me to ask a question. Could the Deputy Prime Minister tell us something about Iraq's domestic pr uh, consumption in terms of crude? If, if what is the current consumption level and what, what is expected up to 2020? Yeah, uh, our current consumption, um, actually our current refining uh, capacity is about um, 600,000 barrels per day. And we are importing um, some uh, petroleum products. With the four new refineries that we are going to uh, build, the total um, production, uh, refining production capacity is going to be 1.5 million barrels per day. Uh, we believe that is going to be sufficient uh, for our domestic needs till um, 2020. Of course, these refineries have to be upgraded. Our current refineries actually are producing 50% um, fuel oil, heavy fuel oil that uh, we don't uh, need. If we are going to get sufficient gas, whether from our own increased gas production or uh, importing from Iran, um, that fuel oil will, will be available for export. Any more questions from the floor? We have a few on this side, please. The front, yeah, thanks. Yeah, hello. <coughs> I'm uh, Paul Young from uh, DME. Thank you very much, Your uh, Excellency, for uh, joining us here. With reference to what Chris from VTOL was saying and how terrible tanker rates are currently, would you like to see Iraq eventually develop its own tanker fleet or just stay as a FOV seller and let people like Chris worry about tanker rates in future? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I just missed because of... So w would, you, would you like Iraq to develop its own tanker fleet so you can compete yes. on a CFR basis or just set, stay in the FOB space and let people like Chris worry about the tanker markets? Yeah. Currently, as you know, Iraq doesn't have any tankers. Uh, this is something that uh, we'll seriously consider in the very near future to um, uh, uh, bring back our tanker fleet um, uh, to the market. Um, it's not our top priority. Our top priority is the infrastructure internally to be able to move uh, our oil. But uh, this is something that uh, we are considering. And this is an opportunity also to invite the tanker companies uh, for a joint uh, venture with the Iraqi tanker company where we can have a, 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 a joint ownership uh, that uh, will be dedicated to 
move Iraqi through. Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Rami Abu Rumeli, and I'm with the Dubai Mercantile Exchange. Uh, my question is Iraq's export, uh, Iraq's export strategy or oil to market is very pipeline heavy. And as we know in the Middle East, there are very few examples where pipelines have been laid across political borders and that have been uh, secure. Now my question is what happens if that pipeline through Syria doesn't materialize, through Jordan doesn't materialize, and then what, so that's, what's your plan B? And then what's your plan to secure those pipelines in the case they were built? Well, um, our main export uh, uh, route is from the Gulf, of course, not only because uh, most of Iraqi oil is being produced in Basra or near Basra, uh, but also um, our most uh, uh, valuable market is in Asia, and um, that's the easiest route to uh, the Asian market. Um, our uh, reliance is going to be based on our new terminals, not only that we have built um, uh, four new single point mooring terminals, but we are going to um, uh, rehabilitate the Basra terminal, rehabilitate the Omeya terminal. The total um, export capacity from that route alone is going to be uh, more than six million barrels uh, per day. But as I uh, tried to explain in my talk that we don't want to rely on um, just that route. Uh, geographically, we are located um, in, a, uh, uh, on, uh, in, in an area where we can access the Mediterranean or the Northern Red uh, Sea. Uh, that's why we are uh, building these um, new pipelines. And uh, of course, um, uh, we have to arrange uh, securing these pipelines um, in those countries where the pipelines are going to pass through, in, uh, and these are Turkey, Syria, and Jordan. And um, we do hope, and um, Iraq is um, exerting all its, um, uh, all what it can, to um, try to find peaceful solution to the problems in the area particularly in Syria, and uh, we are hopeful that the Geneva II conference would lead to some kind of um, uh, peace in Syria, and um, any new um, government uh, will obviously have to focus on rebuilding their economy, and one of the most important factors in, in rebuilding Syrian economy is to actually um, secure uh, pipelines from Iraq for their own domestic needs and also for the export, uh, for the transit revenues that they can get. Do you find, sorry, I'll just interject, do you find that the security situation within Iraq is affecting the transport routes at all, or is it, is it in the back of people's minds, or, or uh, how disruptive can that be? In the Iraqi currents? pipelines in, inside Iraq has been attacked um, all the time. I mean, this is not a new story since 2005. And, um, the um, Iraqi um, uh, teams got so efficient in repairing these damages that once I asked one of the major IOCs, I would not mention in which country, that their pipelines were being attacked all the time. I asked them, how long does it take you to repair? And, and we are talking about large pipelines. And he said, it takes between five to seven days normally to, to repair a major damage to the pipeline. I told them, well, our pipelines are being blown up completely, and we normally fix them within two to three days maximum. He said, well, then we have to come and learn something from oh, Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you are subjected to that kind of terrorist activities, you have to develop skills, and um, uh, actually, um, recently, there has been um, many attacks on the pipelines, but they've not been able to disrupt our export for more than a couple of days. Um, from the north, and the, the attacks are always on the northern pipeline that goes to, currently goes to Jihan. Of course, the Syrian pipeline is not uh, functioning. Okay, well, on that resilience. But in the south, we have no problem with the pipelines. Your Excellency, I'd like to thank you very much for your insight and your thoughts today and for taking the time to be with us on behalf of Gulf Intelligence and our partners today and everybody who's attending. We look forward to talking to you a bit more later in the breakout sessions and in the coffee break. 
Thank you again for your time. Well, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to see you. Thank you. Thank you.